So welcome everyone. My name is Ardra Cole and I'm the founder of Elder Dog and the executive director. We're going to begin um, today with a workshop hosted by Lisa Chance. And the workshop is on the work of a canine death doula. And I'm going to allow Lisa to say more about what a death a canine death doula is and does, because she is one. Um, but I'd also just like to uh, say to those of you who might not have met um, Lisa, that Lisa is um, a member of our board of directors. She's the secretary to the board. Uh, you might have uh, received um, notices and messages from Lisa uh, under the secretary.elderdog email address. And others of you might know Lisa because Lisa is often the very first contact to Elder Dog uh, for those who do not um, who do not connect with us through email or Facebook, but rather pick up that phone and call our toll-free line. So Lisa has a, a vitally important role as um, as the uh, representative, the ambassador to Elder Dog through our toll-free line. And she does many other things as well, but um, I will probably leave it at that. Thank you so much. So welcome to everybody and thanks for taking your Saturday afternoon to spend with us. Okay, so we're going to start by just talking a little bit about um, what it means to be a death doula. And for many people, it has um, a different meaning. Uh, as many people as you probably could talk to about it, you would find that people had a slightly different view. And I think that it's important that I start by saying that this is just my version of that story. I would say that uh, I'm a person whose best work is never finished. I, I tweak things and continue to work on things constantly. And so this is my latest best version of this presentation, but there are always changes happening and um, there are things about the dual world, new ideas, course experiences that are, are being added all the time. So for today, this is, this is my best work, but um, moving forward, there are always changes. My qualification is that I have a diploma in pest, pet loss companioning and hospice care. That is a very hard thing to say, as well as an ac academic certificate in end of life animal care as a canine death doula. However, having said that, um, most of what I'm going to share with you as volunteers, dog owners, caring people, um, you likely already know. And uh, the most important qualification, in my opinion, is a, a sense of empathy and willingness because every situation and every dog and every family will be different and what they really need is care and support. Uh, I will share with you my view of how the role of the death doula can be implemented in a variety of situations and how you can use these same skills to better prepare yourself, your family, your elder dog clients for the journey through the loss of a beloved canine companion. Um, I suspect that for some, it may also pique your interest in either knowing more about how to employ a death doula or becoming one yourself. And I do have some information about that as well. Most of the canine death doula training opportunities are available only in the US, but there are a few that happen in Canada and there are some online opportunities as well. So I have some of that information. I think it's probably a good idea to just make it clear that it's an unregulated industry. And so really the qualifications and experiences and abilities run the gamut, but um, whether you're looking to hire somebody or you're interested in being trained yourself, uh, it does require some research. You know, you should, you should probably do your homework in that category because not all of what's available is, is as quality as you might like. 
I just need one second here because I think what I did is not put that on. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, although the concept of a canine death doula is relatively new, I've, I've provided here a definition of, of a doula and I've crossed off reproductive because that is really where the the bulk of the work happens is with new mums and the birthing of children. But um, the the dual of as a as a role is very rich in history and and somewhat controversial as well. But the word doula comes from the ancient Greek meaning a woman who serves. And it has a it has in the past been most often used, as I said, in relation to a woman who is giving birth or immediately afterwards. But it's also, I think, uh, important to acknowledge that the term doula has at times been controversial. And although it's widely used and considered mainstream as a term now, uh, the word and the practice does have some of its origins in the di difficult history of slavery. And I think it's important to make, make note of that. Uh, the role of a doula has over time expanded and now is not necessarily the role of a woman, but includes women, men, and those who would identify as non-binary. And the services offered have moved far beyond the more traditional prenatal birth and postpartum um, and support a wide range of services that include end of life care and death, of course, afterlife care, prison support, and in our case, animal support, more specifically with our dogs. Doulas are caring, uh, knowledgeable, trained, community-minded support people who are willing to provide guidance, physical and emotional support, kindness, advice, and all during some of life's most difficult challenges. And I think it's important to note that um, a comparison can easily be drawn between the work of a doula and that of many of the de dedicated volunteers of Elder Dog. A lot of what I'm going to talk about, you can probably see some of yourself in, in those particular uh, traits and, and skills. So how can a death doula help? Um, the end of life ca uh, canine doulas are meant to bring comfort and support to dying dogs and their families. Depending on their training, and it is varied, background level of comfort, doulas can provide emotional support, spiritual and practical support. Some may be able to do some medical support, uh, along with assurance and advice for their human companion. I would just put a little caveat in there though, that most doulas are not able to give specific medical support. Um, it would be limited to certain medications and therapies, but um, a vet needs to do the majority of the, the medical intervention. The work of a death doula is about love, support and a sense of peace and understanding at the time of death. It's not a replacement for good veterinary care and advice, but it works in concert with medical expertise. I have put that as part of my mantra throughout this presentation because I, I don't want there to be any confusion that, there, that one replaces the other, they work together. For many pet owners, uh, the prospect of palliative care and the process of death are unknown. And when coupled with the emotional nature of the loss, as, as many of us are aware, it can be excruciatingly difficult. And a death doula can help navigate the process and provide some support for the family. Uh, I had the question posed to me, is the quality of a death determined by the value of a life? And for me, that is a very, very um, in, intertwined. There's a lot of information there to think about. 
But the lives of many dogs are very full and they get lots of support and attention and they live most of their lives with a feeling of security and love. And that's what we would want for them <coughs> as they are. And for most of us, the thought of our dogs dying alone or being alone at their the time of their death is unthinkable and clearly, you know, hard to imagine. But the role of a doula can be uh, to be the person who is with your dog as they pass, because not all people are going to be able to um, to be there during the, the time of death for a variety of reasons. That could include illness. Uh, it could be mental health reasons. It could be family circumstances, distance. Um, there have been number of examples more recently because of pandemic restrictions. And in some cases, people just can't face that loss and feel unable to be present during what would probably be euthanasia. And sometimes life circumstances mean that you're not present because of work or family obligations. And sometimes a person's own health makes plans change and they're just not able to do what, what they want to do for their beloved pet. But it doesn't really matter what the situation is. Uh, a death doula can be a familiar and caring substitute and ensure that the value of a life well lived is in fact a predictor of the quality of a death, surrounded by love and comfort and the human connection. And that is one of the, the main reasons why the doula would be employed. In some cases, a longtime vet or a family member could take that place if you're not able to be there. And particularly in urban centers, you know, there are a lot of people that are living on their own without family close by. A doula might be a good option for them. Uh, many doulas are also willing to connect with owners in a way that is not typical of a vet, I suppose, um, through FaceTime an audio call or provide a video or written account to the owner after the fact. And doulas are there to support the dog and the family and not to pass judgment about what should or should not happen. I think it's important to note that the passing of judgment sometimes happens inadvertently um, when we're working with people who have differing views than us. But um, the goal here is to make sure that the, the dog and the family are both cared for through this process. And so if things are done differently than you would, that doesn't necessarily mean they're not done well or correctly. Um, the thought of losing a pet can be very fraught with emotions, as we know. And... Um, potentially debilitating grief. And I know that Arder suggested that the grief uh, component of this will be addressed separately, but um, it's important to note that opinions, beliefs, personal choices, they could all be very different from each other. And just because they are not in line with your own doesn't mean that they are not valid. And it should also be acknowledged that some people really don't have a lot of choice. Um, I, I suggested personal choices among them, but it, it may not be for some people. But I think the one thing that is common is that all of us want our pets to die with dignity and comfort in a loving and peaceful environment. I think that's what we would all wish for. And in order for that to happen, um, some preparation is required and the inevitable death is made ultimately easier if you have information, if you have support, and if you have planning. And that really does involve the work of a doula if you so choose, but that's really what their, what their main role is, is to provide those things or, or support you through that, that process. So what can a doula do to help? I've decided to use my love of acrostics to describe that. So each of the letters of the word doula have a category that can be described using some of the characteristics that a doula would have. So dignity, organization, understanding, love, and advice. Each of these categories captures some of the work involved. The first one is dignity. 
And um, I really like this quote by Sherwin Newland. And although in this particular case, it's viewed through the lens of a canine death doula, it's, it's still an attempt to describe what dignity is at the time of death. And he has a, a, a really good book all about, um, you know, dying well. And it, it pertains mostly to humans, but a lot of, a lot of what he says certainly pertains to the death of our, our dogs as well. For me, it captures that uh, dignity is about appreciation. Uh, it's about being appreciated for what your life has meant. Um, it's to know and accept that the life is ending and to allow death to happen comfortably as possible. One of the, one of the things that I know um, I struggle with is that, you know, there, there is sometimes the wish that things could be different, but a death doula can't change what is to come, but they can certainly make the event of the death a way to honor a life. And I guess for me, that's what dignity is. Organization is also really important and it will take on um, a fairly large component of what I'm going to talk about because it is the practicality of the situation. Um, and a significant benefit of the support of a doula is their experience and their ability to anticipate and understand the events that go along with the end of the life process, whether that happens at home or in a vet clinic. So a well-prepared doula, I think, uh, will give you some things to collect on your own, but they will provide a list of items that they will bring along as well. Um, all doulas will have a thermometer because temperature of a dog is very important. And you may or may not know that the uh, normal temperature for a dog is between 101 and 102.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Most will use either a mercury or a digital thermometer. They're popular because they're really accurate and they're inexpensive. And they can be used either in the rectum or the armpit. And the armpit is a little less accurate, but some dogs, particularly if they're uncomfortable or you know agitated, will find it difficult to have their temperature taken um, using the rectum. But if you do, you need to leave it there, either in the rectum or armpit for a count of 180 or three minutes to be sure that you have the correct temperature. You might have noticed uh, if you go to the vet that they often use an infrared um, thermometer and they use that in the ear, I believe, for most in most situations. But that's just a um, an ease of process, I guess. You know, it's easier and less messy if they do it that way. And they're only taking that temperature as part of a wellness check, typically not because there's anything particularly important about knowing that it's accurate. Uh, most doulas will have a stethoscope and they make, make uh, particularly the, uh, the actual end of life um, determination a lot easier. It's important to have something like puppy pads potentially or blankets. Um, Blankets or towels can be used for warmth to prevent some, some mess and possibly to transport a, a dog if needed. Um, but you should have some of those on hand if you're, if you're traveling as a death doula. Some also have stretchers. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. I have another slide that I'll talk about. It's a fairly important topic for me because I've been in a situation where I, I didn't have something and, and there are some good options. Uh, a stopwatch is a good thing because there's lots of things to time. You have to uh, be thinking about heartbeats, breaths, maybe bowel movements, medications. And it's good to know that a dog typically has between 120 and 160 beats per minute. And you count those the same as you would your own. So you time it for 15 seconds and count how many there are and then multiply by four. And the easiest place to get a heartbeat in a dog is if you put your fingers uh, just inside the rear leg at about mid thigh, 
and it's easier to do that if they're standing actually so that would be um that would be the way to get the best um indication of beats per minute and then there are some practical things that that are just you know part of your toolkit so a leash and collar, because you could always use those potentially. And if a dog is agitated or needs to be moved, you might need them. And then some things like a bottle of water, snacks, treats, phone charger, Kleenex, cash, note pens, notebook and pens, those sort of things. Because a person doesn't really know where they might end up. And you could be in an emergency clinic. You could be in a vet clinic. You just may be at somebody's cottage rather than at their home. And if you have those things available, it makes it, makes it more comfortable for everybody. There's also um, a fair amount of work done on uh, essential oils for dogs. I have some information about the use of essential oils, but I understand that it's not for everybody. Uh, so I would just put it out there. I'm gonna uh, suggest at the end that maybe if you have questions that are looking for documented information that you can send me an email and that might be one of them. So if you're looking for those essential oil uh, suggestions, I can certainly send those to you. A doula will also provide, as I suggested, a list for the owners. And I kind of think of this as like a go bag for somebody who's going to have a baby. You know, they get a bag ready ahead of time. There are some things that you can do to make that situation a little less stressful. And, and some of them are to have your vets and specialist contact numbers and addresses written down clearly so that they're very easily accessible. Uh, family members' phone numbers. Same idea. Maybe not all family members are going to be present and knowing how to reach them quickly is a good thing for you or the doula. Uh, blankets for comfort and familiarity, prized toys, a clean sheet or towel. And in some cases, people like to have a container um, and a container that would be about the size of your pet so that that it makes transportation a little easier. And you can also use that as your go bag, put all the stuff that you need in it so that it's ready to go. In terms of the container, um, you don't have to have that. It can just be a sheet or a blanket, but if you can picture a, a medium sized dog, particularly if, if you're trying to do some transportation after the fact, it just makes that job a little bit easier. And, I would also say that having these discussions is really important, but there's a balance between being practical about what you need to have and being respectful about this being a really difficult process. So sometimes talking, just talking about a container can be upsetting for people because it feels very impersonal, but if you think about the situation you're in, you want to make sure that for everybody involved, it is the very best it can be. So a doula can explain um, what has happened in terms of once a death has occurred, you'll need to place the dog on their side, um, tuck in their front and back paws, and then tightly swaddle the body in a sheet or towel, which is why you have that on hand. And then they can either be carried or placed in, in a container. Um, there are lots of options for that. It can be a plastic tote. And really, it's just to transport the dog from either the home to the vet clinic or from wherever the dog has died to its burial place, something like that. You could also use a pet crate, uh, a wooden or cardboard box. There are, there are options for that. But being prepared for that makes it a little bit easier. So I alluded to the transport earlier. Um, transportation of um, an ill, injured, or deceased dog can be an issue. And smaller dogs are really easy. They can be put in a blanket or a sheet and carried quite easily. But it's very different for a medium size or a larger dog. And often, um, a doula will have suggestions about where in the house is best for a dog to spend its final hours, 
or what kind of transportation issues might arise based on the choices that you've made for, for where you would like to be. And some will even have some equipment. For example, the tough, um, the tough traveler and the one to, the, to your left, which is, it's actually um, parachute fabric that has handles tightly sewn into the sides and is very sturdy. It, it you'll see in the, in the cost range, it's only $30, but it'll hold 600 pounds. It's pretty hefty. And it rolls up, folds up, and it's just like carrying a towel, basically. Um, there's also some other options, and it depends whether you're going to be by yourself or not. So if you're somebody that's going to be managing a fairly large injured or uh, deceased dog, you're going to not be able to use those first two choices. One of them is the... Um, the tough traveler. The other one is that long, rigid stretcher-like apparatus, which is is a good option too. But both of those, you need to have more than one person. The one that is the most expensive and holds the least weight, it has wheels, so it would be an option for somebody to transport on their own. But having something like that in place is really important. I found myself as an elder dog volunteer one time. My husband and I were trying to assist somebody who had a very sick dog. And all we had for a very heavy dog was a blanket. And I can see how having the tough traveler would have just made that so much better for everybody involved. So having one on hand um, as a doula is really important. Um, a conversation around transportation after a home death is really important too, because there are going to be some choices um, but they're going to be limited based on the size and the weight of the dog. So a good transportation plan is really important so that you're not, you know, overly stressed about something that, that could have been pre-planned a little bit. There are some things that um, a person might want to consider. So uh, do you need anything to assist in moving the dog after it's deceased? Where is the dog going to go? Do you have a plan for that? Um, is it if you're going to have cremation done, it'll obviously be being transported to either a crematorium or a vet clinic. You need to make sure who wherever you're going is expecting you. I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's kind of a good idea to decide who's driving, who's going, and where in the car the dog will go. Because if you already know all of that, then there's there is no um panic or agitation about how that's going to work and a well-designed plan to manage the um the transportation will make that situation just a little bit easier the next thing is the contract and there are two fairly significant areas of um focus, I guess. One of them is that some doulas are very much uh, kind of a voluntary situation. They, they help out where they can. It's not a business to them. There are others that are doing it very much as a business. Their goals are no different, uh, but what is different is one is being paid and one is not. But either way, a contract is a really good idea because you can avoid misunderstandings by ensuring that you have the same expectations about what is going to be done. Uh, you can protect yourself by um, not avo by avoiding some unrealistic, I suppose, expectations. Um, if you're being paid, the contract should talk about how you're being paid and the details of that. Obviously, it should include the name of the dog, the client's name, your name, the pertinent information. Um, if possible, when the services will be provided. So that can be vague. It can say just, you know, um, the day of illness when death is imminent or something like that. Or it could be that it's a planned, uh, a specific plan time. It's also a really good idea to include things that will not be provided. 
so that there's some clarity around that. Cancellation policy is a good idea, particularly if you're somebody that's doing this as uh, a business and is, is charging for it. And signatures, you want, this is the organizational kind of clinical weird part of the job. And a lot of people find um, that to be a little uncomfortable. And so it's a good idea, if possible, to make sure that those details are worked out ahead of time. The next section is about understanding. This is the U in the word doula. And there are a few things to consider about the, the role of understanding. So first of all, um, many pet owners have experienced the death of a pet before, but it may have been many years ago and it may have been under very different circumstances. So understanding what to expect when a pet dies, both physically for them and emotionally for you, is really helpful. Understanding what comes next, having a plan in place for the steps after death is really important. Uh, a doula can certainly provide the information required to help make those important decisions. And uh, we'll talk more about that uh, and some of those options in a little bit. Understanding the differences among people so one of the things that can be really challenging about working with people, as many of you I'm sure know, is understanding and honoring our differences, uh, regardless of how a person's perspective may differ from your own. Most pet owners love their dogs immensely, but that does not mean that we will all think or react and feel the same way. So, we may need different things from a death doula. I, that, that's a distinct possibility. And it's really the job of the doula to recognize that and to work to discover and respect the unique needs of each dog family because they will be different from experience to experience. It's also the prerogative, and this is, this is a bit of a, uh, maybe a controversial part of it, but it, it, it is absolutely the prerogative of the doula to bow out if those differences no longer align with their basic philosophy and code of ethics. So just because you're being paid or you've agreed to something does not mean you'll do whatever you're asked to do. And there's no need to list the things that somebody could ask of you that just do not jive with your philosophy. But um, I think most doulas would agree that there are basic philosophical um, beliefs that they're not willing to compromise. As part of this process of understanding, um, the doula will try to provide a family with a realistic and viable option for dealing with the death of their pet. So some owners might decide that they wanna be with their dog throughout the process and spend every last minute that they can with their pet. And I know we understand that, but we also have to be open to the idea that others may prefer that the doula be present during death, sparing the owner, you know, a, an unbearable situation. These decisions need to be made in consultation and without judgment. So if somebody decides that what is best for them is not at all what you would do, as long as it's reasonable, it, it should be respected. So if you would never think of taking your dog to be euthanized at a vet without you being there and you know holding them till the end, but somebody else can't do that, that is just the differences between people. Um, and the last one is understanding the depth of grief. And I think, that's a huge part of a doula's role because I, I'm not sure pet owners always understand how profound that grief is, even if you've been through it before. Um, my friend who is also a, a dog lover and a parent said to me that it must be kind of like childbirth. It's unbearable at the time, but you forget over time how unbearable it was, particularly if, you know, if you get another dog, but the grief is overwhelming at the time. And many people view their pet as an integral part of their family, which they should. And so the loss is 
very, very difficult. So understanding that grief, a doula can support a family or a person and help them through that. Okay, another Sherwin Newland quote. Um, it doesn't fit exactly with, with the context of our situation, but I do like the fact that um, being understood is part of the path to, um, to love. And I think that this understanding of just how much a dog means to an owner leads us into the idea that love is a huge component of the work of a doula. It's emotionally taxing and the people who choose to do it, do it because of their love for dogs and, and the people that they support and their understanding of the important role that dogs play in our lives. Generally, people who choose to employ a canine death doula do so with the understanding that this person does care deeply for dogs and is interested in supporting uh, their human companions with care and compassion. So love and caring is really at the heart of the work of a death doula. For families, having um, a caring kind of neutral party can also sometimes de-escalate what, what could otherwise be a stressful or traumatic event. And sometimes just knowing that someone else cares is enough to provide support and see the beauty in their dog's life rather than only the sorrow in their passing, which is one of the real challenges of, of the, the loss of a pet. The last in this particular section is about advice. And I don't love the word advice, but it, probably is the best way I could come up with for describing um, the experience and knowledge uh, that a death doula can bring to this situation. So knowing what's happening and a sense of what, what might be next can be really comforting and help relieve some of the anxiety. A doula uh, might have a better sense of when medical intervention is required um, and that can provide peace of mind recognizing some of the normal steps in the process. If this is not something you have a lot of experience with, you don't necessarily know what those normal steps look like. And a doula can help a family feel more confident that, that things are okay. I like to call it, it's the gonna, going to be okay factor. Um, knowing that someone has seen this before and knows that it has worked in the past, if you're talking about massage or touch therapy or any of those kinds of things, can provide viable options for people who then feel supported because it feels like this person, you know, can give them some sound advice. And having some support of a knowledgeable doula helps the family feel guided through the process and less alone, both physically and emotionally which is really important, particularly if that person is on their own. So anybody who knows me knows that planning is my thing. And so planning is a fairly big component of my understanding of the work of a death doula as well. When we have a puppy or a young dog, it seems like it'll be a lifetime, well, literally um, before we have to worry about that. But it's not unlike a young person having a will, you know, thinking about what you would like to see happen for your dog um, when they're young is not a bad idea. And a death doula can be employed at any time during a dog's life. It doesn't have to be in times of crisis or illness or imminent death. Um, and they can really help with the, the kind of planning that, that is required to make um, the death process a little easier. Without a plan, sometimes uh, decisions can be made in the moment that are later regretted and maybe you would have done something different. So the planning process does give you that opportunity to make some choices and, and think about them and revisit them and alter them, whatever, whatever needs to be done. So part of the planning, there are some things to think about. So what would I do in an emergency or in the time of illness? And that might be very different from each other. 
uh, some planning around pet hospice and palliative care, the time of death, after death arrangements, commemoration, grief, and guilt are the things that planning can kind of address and, and help people with. So the first topic really is um, the two different situations where a doula might be involved. So emergencies, um, I, I'm sure all of us have been in a situation where something has happened and, and it, it becomes an emergency situation. It's not where I do my best thinking, I can tell you. Uh, it's a time when you're more in panic mode and uh, if you have some strategies to deal with what to do next, it, it really is helpful. So it's like any risk management, knowing what to do in the case of an emergency is, is always best. You need to know where the nearest emergency clinic is, for example. Um, I know when we moved to Bedford, I was, that was one of the things I was so relieved about is that we were closer to the Metro Animal Hospital, which is the emergency clinic in our area. But if you're on vacation or at the cottage, it's also something you should do. Figure out where the closest clinic is, where's the emergency clinics, because accidents can happen anywhere. We often think we should take along some emergency um, preparedness materials for people, but we should have those for dogs too. So um, any medications or, or things that you think might be helpful in the case of an emergency would be a great idea. Clinic names and numbers should be on hand or in your phone. And it's not a bad idea that if you, if you know of somebody who does the work of a death doula in your area, that you have a conversation with them early on and find out whether they're available in the case of an emergency as well. Most of the time, however, uh, the work of a death doula is done when a diagnosis has happened and somebody's trying to manage an illness. And there's a lot of planning can can happen at this at this stage of of um, the death process, and it's it's planning that's really important. So a doula can offer uh, a range of supports and suggest things uh, outside of their work that may be helpful as well. I, the experience alone sometimes makes that a little easier. But remember that it's always in conjunction with a vet. Um, I. I like to reiterate that as much as possible because although a doula's work is important and it's super helpful, it is not the work of a vet. So you're not talking about somebody that has the ability to make medical decisions. And depending on the illness, you might need to explore what medications or surgery options are available. And those are things you need to do in consultation with a vet. But a doula can help you with deciding things like, you know, what kind of measures are you willing to take? What heroic measures are you willing to agree to? And where, where do you draw the line? And this is a really personal and difficult decision. And I would not be one to say that I have any real perspective on this. My husband and I had a very sick dog and we kept saying, you know, oh, well, we'll just do a little bit more and a little bit more. And I'm not sure we made the right decision in what we did. We will never know, but you can only do the best you have with the information you're given. But if you have the time to think about some of those things ahead of time and to assess your budget, what can you afford? What are you willing to spend? Because that's a reality as well. Um, those are good conversations to have ahead of time so that you're not caught in the heat of the moment with making a decision and, and thinking that, you know, the decision has to be made based on money. Because the other reality is um, some procedures, despite the cost, are generally not going to have an impact. So you have to think about, you know, why are you doing what you're doing? Um, and will, the, will what I'm doing make a good difference? And it, it has to be a positive, a positive difference for sure. But any life-threatening illness is full of questions and concerns, emotions, and there's a lot to work through. So it should be clear that that's not an easy process. Um, the next thing that is, 
kind of an, I, I think it's an interesting area that's getting a lot more, um, I don't know if it's becoming more popular would be the right way to say it, but there are far more people that are willing to explore the idea of pet hospice and palliative care. Um, and I was talking to a woman this morning, actually, who's, who has a, a cat in kidney failure and um, end of stage, you know, where, where the, dog, the cat is actually not going to survive. But so she's, she is providing palliative care for this cat at home. And it's one of those things that you have to be really comfortable with if you're willing to do it on your own. But it is something that a doula can help with. Um, Pet palliative care is, is an option uh, if your pet is suffering from many of the well-known terminal illnesses, but basically if, it's a, if a cure is not possible, that's considered to be palliative. But it's also uh, in the world of the canine death doula, it's also a philosophy of care because a decision has been made not to pursue any further intervention or curative therapy. And so based on that decision, um, the care is delivered so that the animal has the very, very best end of life possible. And this is not the same as uh, managing a long-term illness, for example, like um, chronic kidney disease or congestive heart failure or diabetes or something like that. Those are considered manageable long-term illnesses and they're, they're, not, they're not considered palliative because they don't have that imminent uh, death component. Pet hospice, by contrast, is a lot of people think it's a place because we do have facilities that are called hospice, but pet ho hospice is um, a philosophy based on the principle that death is part of life and that it can be managed in a comfortable, loving, and supportive way. And this could include pain medications, the appropriate use of pain medications. It could uh, employ dietary strategies. It could include massage, touch therapy. But the most important part of uh, pet hospice is the human connection. And it should not prolong suffering of pets. That, that needs to be made clear. And that any uh, pet who's experiencing pain or poor quality of life should be assessed by a vet for sure. Okay, so in, in that same category with pet palliative care and hospice, there are some things that an owner or a doula needs to really watch out for. And there's some signs that things are not going well for your dog. Um, a lot of people think that it has to be whining or whimpering or something that a dog is in pain, but panting or gasping for breath, um, if they don't want anything to do with you, uh, really affectionate past pets that become reclusive is a bad sign their reluctance to move or not eating and drinking. Those are all, those all seem really common sense, but those could indicate that there, there is some difficulty there that you're not aware of or things have taken a turn. And the other thing that doulas can help out with is that hospice care, if you've decided that hospice is the thing for you um, or palliative care for your animal, it's a real commitment to constant supervision and make sure that the pet's um, end of life is very comfortable. So if you choose to hire a doula for this, um, they can be your pet's primary nurse, but, but owners can do that too. And you need to have somebody who's willing to be the link between um, you and your vet and, um, you have to make sure that the vet has agreed that your pet, based on their specific needs, is a good candidate for that kind of at-home therapy and care. So I've given you these, I love charts and organized lists and so on. So I, I've um, found the, these lists that I think are a good culmination of the things that we need to be cognizant of. And the basics of palliative care are not really basic, I guess, they're, but they're a combination of work that 
um, can be the responsibility of the doula, it can be the pet parent, and it absolutely has to include a vet. So it's a, a kind of a holistic approach that takes uh, a commitment from everybody involved. There are physical comforts, and some of these are certainly the responsibility of the vet, but there are also um, other areas that are very easy to do at home. And along with those are the emotional and social components of palliative care. And they're very much the kind of thing that a doula can support a family to achieve. Many of the suggestions um, seem like they're really common sense, but some of them are a challenge to balance and remember that uh, quality of life is super important. And quality of life balanced with protecting a struggling pet can be, can be difficult. Um, I couldn't help but think when I was writing some of this um, slide presentation that it, it has some similarities to a situation I found myself in where um, an occupational therapist was talking to me about the quality of life of uh, my husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And she said, you know, you don't want to ruin his life to save it. And I, you know, questioned that initially and thought, what are you talking about? Of course, I wouldn't do that. But she was quite right. You know, you can't stop somebody from doing something they really enjoy just to keep them safe because they're struggling with something like Alzheimer's disease. And I could see that there was some, um, some similarities in these two things. So for example, preserving engagement with other pets. You know, it might be your first instinct to keep the cats and, and other pets away from a sick dog, but that's maybe not what they need at all. You wanna make sure that you don't isolate a pet and, and keep them away from the rest of the family. You also wanna maintain some routines and behaviors that they're used to so that you don't overstress them. So there's some, some good reminders in there that just give you a sense of some of the things that, that might feel a little counterintuitive when you're trying to protect a dog you dearly love. So we're not gonna delve too deeply into the time of death, but there are some things that are helpful to know, and especially for those who may wish to be the support person in these situations for your own dog. Um, there is some good information that's helpful. So if euthanization is your choice, um, euthanasia is certainly something a doula can support clients with, but will never do. Unless you have a doula who is um, dual qualified also as a vet, uh, doulas are not medically trained professionals. So that would, that would have to happen uh, under the care of a veterinarian. Deciding when is the right time is, as most pet owners would know, a very hard thing. And it's something a doula can help with, but ultimately that decision has to be in the hands of the owner. The owner knows the dog well, and with the guidance of a doula uh, giving some information about, you know, what is happening through the death process, it really does have to be the owner's choice. Um, also keeping in mind, uh, and I know that this is a really hard thing to do, but uh, when you're having a dog euthanized, this is really the time for you to say goodbye. So to be as calm and loving as possible for their sake, and for yours uh, is really important. But having been one of in one of those situations, it's not an easy thing to do. So to prepare yourself in some way so that you kind of have a mantra or a, an idea of how you're going to um, cope with this is a good idea because you want to really treasure that time. And the last thing about euthanasia is that there, there are some clinics across Canada that do perform euthanasia at home, but this may need to be something that you plan ahead and it may not always be possible, but there are some times if you're planning to take your, your dog to the clinic and have it done, there are some times that are better than others. For example, end of day, 
or the beginning of the day is better um, in lots of ways because it gives you some privacy. Um, it's also a good idea if you know this is coming to go to the clinic ahead of time and pay for it so that that doesn't have to be done at the time of death. I remember that being very challenging for me to do after I had a cat put down, going back to the clinic was, I, I had no idea I was gonna react so poorly, but I did. Um, I was fortunate enough though in that situation that it, it happened on a night when there was a bit of a storm and uh, the power had gone out and I was never so relieved to have no power because it was not only dark, but there was nobody else there. So it worked out nicely, but that was my, then they agreed to do the euthanasia anyway, even though the power was out. So it worked out nicely for me. Um, some dogs will die at home unexpectedly, but generally a sick die, uh, sorry, a sick dog will only die at home with the support of a vet. But a doula and some very well-informed and prepared family members can do this if they wish to, but there, there are lots of things that you need to be cognizant of. Um, managing pain and a calm and loving environment is critical. It's important to be able to confirm death. And um, that sounds ridiculous probably, but um, using a stethoscope or and or a thermometer is often difficult to really confirm death because the pet is likely at the end of life breathing shallow and probably transitioning and death is likely near. So it, it is sometimes hard to confirm whether a dog is uh, passed if you're doing this at home. So that's something you need to be aware of. Not afraid of, but just it's normal and confirming death is important. And after a pet dies, if you're home, um, typically there are some things that happen that are just, they're just body, you know, bodily functions. Um, bowels may release. This can happen right away or it may not happen at all, but it's dependent on whether the dog has eaten recently, whether it's dehydrated, but you should be prepared for that. So for example, if your dog is uh, lying on a piece of furniture or a carpet, um, it might be a good idea to have a blanket or a towel or something underneath their hind end just to ensure that that uh, you're prepared for that. Something I didn't know before is that um, if there are other pets in the home and your dog is going to die at home, it's really important to introduce those other pets to the deceased animal. Um, they naturally know what to do. They know what's happened, but it gives them the opportunity to understand what's happened. And many other pets will act aloof, like it doesn't matter to them, but it's a really important part of that process. The scent of the deceased pet is what the living pet really needs to understand what has happened. And they don't have to be right beside the, the deceased animal. They can just be in the same room and they will understand what has happened. But it's, it's a very important part of that passing and something a doula can help you with if that's difficult for you. Um, if there's anybody that kind of finds this information, this next little bit's a little, a little difficult because it's talking about what to do with the body of your deceased dog. And it is something that, you know, particularly if your dog dies at home, that, that has to be dealt with, but it, it, it is kind of yucky. So I'll just warn you of that. But if you're, if you're not burying your dog right away or transporting your dog right away to the vet, you should know that that you should do that positioning. You should tuck their legs in and wrap them in a, in a blanket. And that's because um, we know that rigor sets in after three to four hours and completely after about 12 hours. So depending on the position your, your dog was in when they died, um, you, you will want to make it as easy as possible to not only transport them, but to bury them if you're going to do that at home. Um, you should just try not to leave them with outstretched limbs, particularly with really large animals, because that makes it very challenging. Um, 
transportation we've talked about quite a bit. And there are some options that are that are really good ones, for, particularly for larger dogs. Um, clean up, uh, just a couple of suggestions about um, dogs being on furniture or carpet. You don't want to leave them there any length of time. I, I know this sounds almost ridiculous, but there is a scent that comes from a deceased dog that is almost right away. It happens with humans too. And so it can be a bit of a challenge to get that smell out of soft fabrics. So it's important to make sure that you do uh, remove the body right away or that you have something under the dog when it's dying. Um, but the other thing that I think is really important to say is along with all this stuff that happens physically, it's really important to be present uh, during the process uh, and be clear about what's happening. And it will make it will make it easier for you later if you have felt like you're part of the process. And a doula will really encourage that for sure. So there are some after death arrangements that can also um, be part of, of what a, a doula can help with. Much of this, I think most people already know. Um, cremation is a great option. And you can do that as either an individual cremation or a common one. Uh, the individual cremation is best if you'd like to keep the ashes and have them returned to you. Um, but you should think about what you will do with the ashes. That's an important part of it as well. Um, but it doesn't have to happen right away in this case because the ashes can be returned to you and they can be in your care for as long as you wish in a sealed container and, and you know, you can make your decision about that another time. Um, some people like to make arrangements for their pet cremains to be buried along with them or combined with them um, after they've died. Um, but they should be kept in some kind of an urn or a vessel. It's not required. They do get returned to you in uh, usually in plastic inside cardboard but you have to just make sure that they are, are free from any moisture and there's no danger of them spilling, that kind of thing. The amount of cremains depends entirely on the size of your pet and whatever you choose for a vessel should reflect that. Um, you can decide ahead of time or after the fact where the ashes will be kept, but if you choose to keep them close, and that's what my husband and I have done with, with ours, um, that's great. But if you choose to spread them, you need to consider whether or not it's legal to do so where you're doing it. And, and municipalities have ordinances about such things if it's not on your own private property. You should also choose a very calm, dry day for obvious reasons. They're very susceptible to wind. And they can also be buried, which a lot of people don't, don't necessarily consider, but they, they can be. And in the container, if you like, but it should be biodegradable, of course. Uh, as with many things, you could spend a lot or a little in this particular area and Prior planning does really help because if you go to the crematorium and try to purchase an urn when you're upset, um, you may not leave with the, the type of vessel that you have a budget for. So that's something to think about. And you, you might want something that is um, more suiting to your dog for you know whatever reason, but um, a purchased urn is just one of the options. And the other type of um, after death arrangements would be burial, of course. And you need to choose a location for burial that is on your own property. There are a few things you need to be careful about like proximity to a well or a water source. And you wanna make sure that if a dog is being buried on your property that you bury deep enough and so that it's not susceptible to other wildlife. 
But one of the other things that I think is an important consideration is that you might also want to think about what is the possibility that you would be moving anytime soon. Because um, if you bury a dog on your property and then you choose to leave there, that could be very difficult for you. So it, it might be something to just consider. Um, weather is also a consideration. And in Canada, that could mean that without heavy equipment, burial for several months of the year is not possible. So um, you might want to think about plan B. So if burial is your first choice, you might want to consider what else you could do if it's the middle of January. There is also one other uh, option, and there's a, a medical science option. If your dog has died from a very unusual illness or a rare condition, there are some research uh, clinics that would be happy to use um, what they can learn from your dog's experience. So that might be something that you could investigate depending on, on the situation. So pet funerals, um, these could run the gamut. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them, but there are, um, there are lots of ways that you can remember uh, your dog and lots of crematoriums offer services like um, formal services, memorial services for pets. But that can also be done with the support of a doula. It can be done um, in a very basic way. It doesn't have to be um, a big gathering. Um, it could just be a small, intimate um, funeral where you just have a few family members graveside or a beloved special location where you're spreading the ashes, something like that. It can be religious. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it can be a celebration of life. Um, the options are really endless, but whatever you decide to do, it's to honor the life of your pet, whether it be a formal funeral or not. Commemoration is another thing that is not only important for, um, you know, the, the celebration of a life and the honoring of a life, but it also really helps with the grief process. So um, it's a far more common way for us to honor pets than it used to be. And uh, most doulas have a repertoire of suggestions and many of them you're going to be familiar with, I'm sure, but there, there are gravestones that can be commissioned. You can have a simple painted stone or a wooden monument. Um, a marble headstone, and those can be used whether your dog is buried or cremated. It, there doesn't have to be a body or ashes underneath a stone. It can just be for remembering. Uh, writing is also a great way to both remember a pet and process the loss. Uh, my grandmother used to say that you don't know what you think until you see what you say. And uh, what she meant by that was that the process of writing things down really helps to clarify your thinking. And at the same time, uh, I guess it also documents your memories to save and revisit at another time. There are many lockets and pendants, rings and other kinds of jewelry designed specifically to hold a sample of cremains and keep that feeling of your pet being close. I think those are especially helpful days and weeks following the death when, when the loss feels so raw. Um, having a portrait done or framing a special photo is also good to create a visible memory because it really is the memory that's the important part of this. Of course, I would um, acknowledge that the annual Elder Dog Butterfly Release um, is a wonderful event to remember our beloved pets and is helpful also in the grieving process. It's a very emotional, um, a very emotional event and is well attended every year. And I always, I always think what a what a wonderful way. Every time I see a monarch, I think it must be my little Otis. Um, you can make a one-time or recurring donation. That, that's always a way to, to remember your pet. 
And that donation can be made to any organization, obviously, but usually it would be something that, that honors the human animal bond. Uh, there are some commemorative urns. So you could keep the ashes in something that's specifically designed to remember your pet with their name and something about them if you so choose. Um, an urn can be buried, it can be left in your house, it can be um, kept anywhere that is, that is um, special to you. Uh, it can be saved and buried along with you, as I've said before, or it could be um, honored in a chapel-like place to pause, which is a wonderful place to take an urn and, and leave and come back and visit and, and honor the memory of your pet. It's a beautiful location, I don't know how many people have had the pleasure of visiting, but it's amazing. Um, this chapel is located on the Elder Dog land property at Phelps and South. Planting a tree or a shrub is also a very popular thing to do. It's eco-friendly and it makes the commemoration a little more private and permanent. And it's a way to visit your pet and create traditions and rituals in their memory. Um, I've included a picture here of the memorial garden that's been started at Elder Dog Land. And we've planted trees and shrubs in honor of both beloved dogs and dedicated volunteers. Guilt is the last one that we're gonna talk about with any, any, at any length. And guilt is the if only thing. Although the circumstances of every loss are different, it seems like guilt finds its way into our uh, emotions no matter what. So pet loss is particularly present and overwhelming um, or the guilt associated with it in the early days after a loss. And you know, you start asking yourself, well, if only I'd shut the door, if only I'd noticed the sign sooner, if only I hadn't given him a treat, whatever the cause of the death was, you second guess by asking yourself questions. Oops. Um, there's also lots of questions about why didn't I do more? Why didn't I ask more questions? Why didn't I push for an earlier appointment? Um, it's, it's a really challenging situation because in hindsight, everything is clearer. Um, but you can't prevent what you don't anticipate. And, and if you do your best, you know, as much as, as we don't want to have to deal with the guilt, it, it seems to find its way, whether we've done our best or not. Uh, euthanasia also comes with some guilt. And uh, some of that is around trying to decide, you know, did I do it too soon? Um, could I have, you know, could, the, could my dog have had better days? Did we give up on him? Um, I, think, I think often we feel like we've betrayed our pet if we put them to sleep when we all know in our heart of hearts that we only do that because we know we're doing what's best for them. But some of the more difficult uh, challenges around guilt though are when, when a pet is lost um, to a traumatic accident or a pet goes missing and we can't believe we didn't foresee the danger or do something to prevent it. Um, I would just say as an aside that uh, it's important to note that a doula can be a great support in a situation where somebody's experiencing the grief after the loss of a pet, but they are not medical professionals. And sometimes the grief that somebody's experiencing is completely out of the realm of their expertise. And they, you know, medical professionals should be consulted in some situations. So it's not like a doula can perform those kinds of, of interventions. You know, it's, it's, a, it's at a very basic level, really. Um, but what, what is helpful from a doula's perspective is that they are somebody who has some pet death experience and they won't necessarily take that dreaded feeling away, but can help you with some perspective to maybe better understand the role of guilt and forgiveness in the grieving process and, and that it, it can happen regardless of how the death occurred. 
It's also helpful to know that guilt by nature is about trying to just make sense of the circumstance and, and understanding why something has occurred. And it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with one's role in the event. It can happen regardless. Um, my favorite definition for forgiveness, which is a huge part of guilt, is uh, one that my grandmother used to use. And she was very pragmatic and uh, although loving, she would say that forgiveness is giving up the hope the past will be any different. And when I think about this, the times in my own life that I felt really guilty of something, all I wanted it was for it to be different. And that's just not how that works. So, but you can't move on um, if you can't accept what has been. And it can't be changed, so acceptance is, is what is required to put the guilt aside and, and find some peace. So it's a, although it's not something that doulas generally have a lot of experience with in terms of, of what guilt is all about, um, I think it is something that, that just as compassionate humans, we can help each other with. This is just a reminder that uh, we've touched on, on how you might be able to help other pets in the household to deal with the death. But I think sometimes people feel like they wanna shield their children from, from the death of a pet. And certainly there are some components of it that they shouldn't be part of, but they should have the ability to say goodbye and, and be included in, in the grieving process so that they can understand what's happened and, and understand that feeling terrible about it is okay and that it will get better. And the last slide that we're going to talk about, I'm a little over time, I apologize for that, but is, is about grief and how you will ex you're gonna feel after the death of a pet is just gonna vary from person to person and every situation is, is kind of different. Sometimes an accidental death is harder for different reasons, but there are challenges with old age and illness as well. And, and all of it just boils down to sorrow and loss. And a doula, you know, although we can't take that uh, grief away, a doula can often be somebody that can be counted on to understand those emotions and um, can help with strategies and, and support for how to cope with the immediate difficulties and give suggestions about how to proceed or what to do next. And although grief is a huge component of a pet death, um, it, and can be a large part of a doula's work, they can't offer professional support. So what they can offer wouldn't be unlike what a, a family uh, member or a close friend could do um, after a traumatic event. So you should also know that we're um, planning a follow-up workshop that will give more detail and more uh, emphasis on, on grief. And we're so lucky that we um, have someone far more qualified than me to speak on the issues around uh, the human animal bond and the grief that is so profound after the loss of the relationship with a beloved dog. Um, so the, our next workshop will be a follow-up to this one and will be presented by um, Ardra Cole. And the date for that will be announced as soon as it's confirmed, but she will take up where I have left off in terms of the grief part of it. And, and we'll discuss that at, at length. So the only thing I have left to share is um, at the end of the presentation, you'll see that there's a fairly lengthy list of links. Those are all links to um, websites that may be helpful in terms of training pet palliative care, grief, and uh, I've included the one on canine massage because I think that touch therapy and massage is, is a great one. Um, and I also have, I'm just going to stop sharing that. So I also have um, a fair number of links that would be um, links that you could use uh, for academic papers or books or articles that talk about the role of a doula and the end of life process. And I'm happy to share some of that as well if somebody would be interested, but I could do that by email probably is the easiest way. 
And my email is secretary um, at, no, secretary.elderdog at gmail.com. So if you have questions or something that you would like to ask that is related to me sending you something, um, you can certainly send me an email to that address, secretary.elderdog at gmail.com. Okay, that's all I have to offer, but I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, I was just sitting here um, listening and watching and, and just thinking about the enormous wealth of information and how it applies uh, to us as individuals, but also as volunteers, because so much of what you said um, you know, reminded me of stories that I've heard from our volunteers about how they have in so many ways um, served as doulas. Um, yeah, no question. And, uh, and I think that's, you know, I think hearing, hearing you talk about the role of death doula and all of the various things to think about, um, I think is, is very affirming. At least I certainly found it quite affirming, you know, because I was thinking, of course, in my own situation, both as a, as an individual and also as a, an elder dog volunteer, um, you know, with a fair breadth of, of experience, um, uh, you know, across the years. And so, yeah, I think reaffirming, reaffirmation is, is or affirmation is such an important, uh, important thing to, to have and to feel. So thank you for that. And thank you for all that you have provided. And uh, we probably have a few minutes for some comments and I see Pam has her hand up. Really enjoyed the presentation, Lisa. And uh, I guess my follow-up question um, has to do with um, the role of a canine death doula sort of as a liaison between the owner and the veterinary clinic or the vet practice. Um, I'm just sort of curious because it's kind of maybe something that's sort of new um, what um, the perception has been with vet clinics dealing with an intermediary and what kind of steps need to happen maybe from the owner contacting them. Like it's kind of a, a vague sort of- Yeah, you know, I know what you're box. saying. Typically a vet won't give any information to anybody but the dog owner. So, the benefit of having some information ahead of time is that you can go with the person that you're supporting and you can talk to the vet because there's going to have to be some working together anyway between the owner and the vet. So if you can attend um, a vet appointment with them, that's probably the very best. Have some conversations about what the doula is willing to provide, what the vet would like them to provide. Um, what the limits kind of are. And I think as a dual, your responsibility is to set those limits. So I'm really interested in being a support person. I have lots of experience with medications, you know, giving medications, but I am not interested and make sure that the line is drawn between where your comfort level is and, and what the vet is willing to support you to do. Does that yeah, help? Yeah, I get that. Yeah, very much. And I can see each each sort of vet clinic may have their own sort of willingness, to, you know, in terms of how far they're willing to work yeah. with somebody as well. And it's so. like almost anything, you know, you're going to have some vets that are really open to it. And they think it's, a, I, I kind of liken it to a nurse practitioner because there are some doctors that really love working with nurse practitioners and there are others that feel like it kind of crosses the line. I'm sure the same thing happens with vets. Um, but it's it's like working with people generally. You just have to do what you can where you can. And if it's not working, you have to accept that that sometimes is going to be the case, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. The other sort of secondary thing, so much of, uh, oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to add so much of, I think, the quality of life decision um, often is a big, big thing for many, many people making that final decision. 
Um, and I can see where a doula, you know, would be very beneficial in many cases to have a more impartial kind of view into, into that as well. Yeah, I like to think about their role in those sort of situations as the person who presents the questions. So um, have you thought about this? Or what would you like to happen in this situation? Or if this happened, what would what would your reaction be? Or um, if you knew this was the case, what would you want to do? So that you can kind of pose those questions ahead of time and it gives the, the family a chance to think about what their answers to those questions are and it makes that decision that is excruciating just a little bit more confident, I think. Not easier, but more confident. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so question from Gail in the chat box. I joined a little late, so maybe you covered this. Will you be focusing at all on behavioral euthanasia and counseling? Something that I deal with too often in my work with dogs. Uh, Trish McMillan has a good course on this. So the whole issue of behavioral euthanasia and counseling. Uh, it's not something I have a lot of expertise in, so it's not something that I included. Um, I think you have to have experience doing that to feel confident supporting others, and I don't. Mm -hmm. Secretary.elderdog at gmail.com is my email address for Elder Dog. And if you walk away and sort of process some of this and then think, oh, I wonder if, feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to answer the question or find out the answer to the question or say, I have no idea. <laughs> whatever, whatever applies, I'm happy to uh, address your question if I can. And, you know, I, for anybody that's lost a pet, it doesn't seem to matter whether it's two days, two months, two years, you know, there are things that can trigger you. There are things that somebody can say that reminds you of something and, you know, it can be emotional regardless. Yeah. I'm not usually so uh, stoic, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi. Um, when my little dog passed last year, um, I had an excellent palliative care team through my vets for a small fee every month. But they had a, a checklist for monitoring the dog's quality of life because she was ill for a few, day, few years. So I found that useful, you know, like to, to just monitor, do once a week or however however long or uh, you know every day or every week and if you get a certain number you know just help me to judge what her quality of life was like being alone with the dog I didn't have input from anybody else except while well, the palliative care team but I found that to be a really helpful tool I don't know if anyone else has heard of that those checklists are very specific to the condition the dog is uh, living with but they're invaluable to a doula as well, because sometimes, you know, they're not a medical professional. So sometimes they are in the same situation as the owner and, and may be struggling with, you know, what am I seeing here? So they're really helpful. And a vet that has some experience either with palliative care uh, through owners or doulas would be more than happy to do that. It's a great suggestion. Yeah, and I think there um, there's some um, kind of a a more general uh, checklist on quality of life where you you know there are certain areas or categories that you consider, um, and I think it's uh, uh, well it skips oh, me right now. But you know you you do um, kind of take the pulse so to speak on a regular basis and and do rate that. And uh, actually, we're going to put that resource up on our new website which is forthcoming I mean I know I know that many of us who have listened um, and and kind of participated in the presentation and you know in many different ways have seen ourselves and our own experiences you know personally as individuals um, but I'm also imagining that many volunteers have uh, or many people in the volunteer capacity with elder dog, you know, have kind of seen themselves um, because, you know, because of the nature of what we do, um, uh, you know, dogs at end of life are, you know, something that is, um, that we're challenged with and by on a very regular basis. So, um, you know, I'm pleased that we're going to have this recording available for people who, 
for you who have been here and others who uh, couldn't make it. Um, so thank you so much for uh, all that you put into today's session. Uh, very, very much appreciated. So you're welcome. Thank you. Um, and as Lisa mentioned, um, our next workshop is going to be a follow up um, dealing with grief and um, companion animal loss and, and bereavement. And uh, I'm going to be uh, hosting that uh, workshop. 